certainly I do use it at extreme altitude, it thins the blood slightly. I wouldn't touch aspirin with a barge pole at altitude. Hello, that was a recording of the Alpine Club Everest Gong. And this is a recording of me, now I'm away on a paternity expedition. My name's Nick Smith, speaking to you from London. Welcome to the seventh in our series of Alpine Clubcasts. Tonight we're exploring medical dilemmas in the high mountains. I really hope you enjoy it. If you're watching live on YouTube, please add any questions to the chat there as we go along, and we'll try to get those answered at the end. And as usual, anyone in Zoom, you'll be unmuted at the end for any applause, and do stick around for a chat. Since man realised that oxygen is depleted at altitude, the British have played a major part in the study of high altitude physiology. The Scottish chemist, physiologist and mountaineer Alexander Kellis died on the way to Everest Base Camp in 1921. The physiologist Griff Pugh was an active skier and mountaineer whose application of science to altitude was instrumental in the success of the 1953 Everest expedition. This tradition continues to this day and two of our speakers tonight summited Everest as part of an important research expedition in 2007. In the UK, we have well over 300 doctors, nurses and paramedics who hold the International Diploma of Mountain Medicine, which has a syllabus covering all the skills a medic might need in the mountains, climbing included. And all tonight's speakers are involved with the UK Diploma. Many of those who hold the diploma are available to give advice and support to lay mountaineers, and I'm especially grateful to Dr David Hillebrand who helped me get back into the mountains with a vengeance after I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2015. So now I'm going to hand over to David, who's a member of the British Mountain Medicine Society, besides being the honorary medical advisor to the BMC. David is going to introduce our speakers further. Are you there, David? I am here, uh, Nick, although you are not. So thank you to Nigel, who's standing in for you, and to Nick for those kind words. Uh, Nick, as he said, embarked on an expedition nine months ago, and by all accounts, he and his partner were on the summit push yesterday. So I hope all has gone well. Uh, this session is a little bit different from other presentations in that we're very heavily reliant on interaction with you, the audience. So I hope you will come up with questions during the presentations. We hope tonight will be entertainment during the COVID lockdown and an absolute dream for all the neurotic members of the Alpine Club. But we also hope it'll educate one or two people going on trips to the Alps and the Greater Ranges. We have three presentations tonight and the brief given to the presenters who are all familiar with giving advice to expeditions in the field was to imagine they had a satellite call or an email from a bivy or base camp and how they might go about giving uh, advice or have wish they had educated the people before they go. When I say a, uh, a bivy, I mean a relatively controlled bivy not like the one we heard about from Rick and Sandy Allen last week on Nanga Parba, where, to be honest, I think physiologically they were beyond any advice we could have given. Uh, they survived brilliantly and totally enjoyed that talk. So with no more ado, I'm going to go on to our first presenter tonight, Jeremy Windsor. Um, as with the other speakers, He's been on research expeditions to Cho Oyu and Everest. The Cordwell trip in 2007 was one of the summiteers on Everest and Cho Oyu. He holds the Diploma of Mountain Medicine. He lives in Hathersage and uh, is a critical care anaesthetist at Chesterfield Hospital. If there are any junior doctors out there, he wanted an advertisement for their fellowship in mountain medicine where well, I'm afraid you are forced during the year to complete the diploma amount in medicine with the 50% of the syllabus being in the hills in winter in the Alps and in Snowdonia. Uh, recent routes include uh, Lion Ridge on the Matterhorn, the southwest face of the Don de Géant, 
and the Papillon Red. So Jeremy, over to you please for some, I think a case study or some wise words on altitude problems. Thank Great. you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Alpine Club, for allowing me to speak. Uh, given so much experience that there is in the Alpine Club, uh, I thought rather than just uh, focus on some dry facts, I'd share a case with you. This is a, a real case that uh, occurred in the late 90s, and I thought it would be useful uh, to be able to show you just how difficult it is to diagnose acute mountain sickness and perhaps some offer some uh, hints and tips along the way to try and uh, uh, help you in your, your mountaineering. Just a, a quick moment on acute mountain sickness. AMS in a nutshell occurs in poorly acclimatized people above two and a half thousand meters. Uh, chances of you getting it depend upon uh, the rate you ascend, the, uh, the altitude you reach, and your genetic makeup. Symptoms are headache, dizziness, fatigue, and gastrointestinal symptoms. So anything from an upset stomach through to nausea and vomiting. Best prevented by ascending slowly, less than approximately 500 meters a day is normally recommended. But we know that drugs such as acetazolamide, that's Diamox, uh, can help the acclimatization process. So onto the case. Uh, the case takes place on this mountain, which I'm sure will be very familiar to a lot of Alpine Club members. This is Mount Kenya, uh, taken shortly before an Alpine Club trip there last year. Uh, two peaks, Nellian in the foreground, uh, at 5188 meters and Batian just out of sight behind uh, at 5199. The case involves two climbers, Andy and Bob, whose names have been changed for the presentation. Uh, Andy and Bob got in touch uh, with us through our Mountain Medicine blog and over the course of a series of emails showed, uh, shared uh, their story. Uh, they were climbing the southeast face of Nellian which is there just above the right hand side of the, the hut roof. It starts there climbing up on that face and moves then out onto the ridge, which you can see on the right uh, is, in sh is casting a shadow there and the route takes a, 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 a le just left of that. So let's just show you a little bit of the southeast face of Nellian. Uh, it's a long route, you know, it's uh, best part of 16 pitches of rock climbing above 5,000 meters for most of it. Typically uh, ascent times four to eight hours. Uh, the route goes from Austrian hut, it weaves its way uh, to a starting point at about 4,800, 4,850, climbs the face and then you encounter a first bivouac hut, uh, uh, Rusty Bailey's bivy there at 5,000 meters. Uh, that's for many people just a, a, a pausing point, but for Andy and Bob, it was in fact a, a destination. They decided to spend a, a night there at the Bailey's Bivy before continuing the next day uh, on the ridge, just to the left, past the de Graaff variation, the famous severe, hard, severe rock pitch on, on Mount Kenya. Goes at about 4A, 4B, but with a rucksack at 5,100 meters, it's, it's a good challenge. Uh, and then up to uh, Ian Howell's hut there, uh, just below the summit of, of Nellian at 5188. So that was their objective. And this was how they got to Austrian hut in the first place. I've put two curves on, on that. The, the green curve, the green line is the line we followed when we climbed Kenya last January. You can see a very conservative ascent profile. So the first night, spent at the park gates at Chigori at 2950 and then a very slow uh, and gradual ascent about four or five hundred meters a day with a rest day at just under four thousand meters and then finally taking six days to reach Austrian hut. Andy and Bob on the other hand took a more uh, positive approach shall we call it so they took uh, a night at the park gates at 3050 on the Mackinders route the next day went up to 4200 meters and from there, they decided then to get onto the route. So at that point, after two nights on the mountain, uh, they started at lunchtime and made their way to uh, Bailey's Bivy at 5,000 meters before eventually reaching the next day, uh, Ian Howell's hut there at 5,180. So two very different ascent profiles. This is Bailey's Bivy as of uh, uh, January 2019, largely clear of snow now. Uh, the door was lost many years ago uh, and does give room for uh, 
an uncomfortable bivvy, but a bivvy nevertheless. Now, when Andy and Bob arrived there, remember they'd left at about midday and started climbing. They arrived at about six o'clock in the evening. And these were Bob's symptoms. So arrived at the bivvy at 16, 1800, sorry. Uh, they slept the night, albeit poorly, and at four o'clock in the morning, that was their time to wake up and set off for their next day. Bob complained of a headache. He scored it seven out of 10. He felt very tired and lightheaded. Now at the time they put it down, they put these symptoms down to a combination of different uh, problems. They were a little hungover. Between them they drunk a small bottle of whiskey the, the night whilst the, that they spent in Bailey's bivvy. They felt dehydrated, they felt they hadn't carried the water that they should have done. Uh, and there was no snow to melt inside of uh, Bailey's bivvy as there had been in previous years. They hadn't drunk any coffee for two or three days. They'd gone very fast and light and hadn't packed their coffee, so they were worried that they were withdrawing from caffeine. Bob thought he might have been brewing a cold, and he felt stressed. He, he was quite freely admitted that they were on a big mountain, and uh, uh, he was a little worried uh, for the day ahead. So instead of setting off at four o'clock, they decided to spend a couple of hours uh, resting. Bob took some paracetamol, they had a couple of cuffs of coffee, and they drunk some water and decided to press on. So from Bailey's Bivy, as mentioned before, they need then to approach the de Graaff variation, the, the, the crux pitch. Well, unfortunately, they got a bit lost along the way. A few false starts, they, they spent more time on the ridge than they probably should. So yes, they, so they departed at 6 a.m., but didn't reach the de Graaff pitch until about one in the afternoon. So that was about six or seven hours from setting off. Now, that's only about 100 meters of vertical height gain, so it's a very slow uh, ascent profile, but admittedly they, they had a few false starts and had to retreat and find the route again. So they got to the top of de Graaff variation pitch a little bit worse for wear. This is the, the, the de Graaff pitch as of 2019. Uh, uh, reminds me of a sort of Cornish sea cliff severe. Steep and a bit unforgiving but well protected. When he got to the top of the uh, uh, de Graaff variation at one o'clock, the headache was now 10 out of 10. They were tired, moving very slowly. Bob clearly remembered feeling very lightheaded and nauseous wasn't able to drink much, uh, uh, drunk a little. Uh, now they thought the symptoms were a combination of tiredness, dehydration, a cold that was brewing, uh, and for the first time they admitted to a bit of altitude. They thought, well, could altitude be playing a part? So they decided at the top of the pitch to take a 30 minute rest period, which they did. They took some paracetamol. Uh, they drank the remaining water. It was only a few hundred mils, and they, they made a a change to their plan. They decided that Bob would only second and he gave all his kit to uh, his partner and they abandoned the idea of traversing the gate of the mist. That's the crossing over to uh, Batian. So they were just going to climb to the Nellian summit and spend the night at the, the Howl Hut. So on they went, yep, towards uh, the Howl Hut. They eventually reached the hut at seven in the evening. So when you work it out, they'd been on the mountain climbing about 19 hours by this stage. So that was slow by any, any means. Uh, but they got there just before, before uh, nightfall. And those of you who've climbed near the equator, you'll know that how quickly uh, it gets dark. You can be climbing one minute in, in broad light and then suddenly it's darker. And they got there uh, on the stroke of around seven o'clock and it became dark the moment they reached the hut. So. How were they shaping up? There's Ian's hut, uh, a wonderful place to spend the night, I'd recommend it. Uh, 7 p.m., headache now, Bob's headache was 10 out of 10. Exhausted, unable to sit or stand, lightheaded and vomiting. He was tired, uh, they put it down still to dehydration, the cold, the altitude, but it was very clear uh, that Bob wasn't going anywhere. They decided that they'd rest the night in the hut and the following morning, they made a decision that uh, Bob would remain in the hut and uh, his partner would descend. Uh, that's in fact what he did. And 
uh, incredibly, uh, Bob's partner did the 16 or 17 abseil pitches, uh, got down, uh, walked his way across the moraine, you can see there, and returned to the Austrian hut by late morning. Uh, and credit to the, uh, the rescue team and the, uh, the park warden there uh, at the hut, uh, they were able to summon a rescue team that reached uh, the hut uh, by mid-afternoon. And in fact, they reached the Howell Hut uh, sometime in the early hours uh, of, of the, the next morning. They were then able to uh, carry and lower uh, the, the uh, Bob down uh, the mountain and was able to reach uh, the Austrian Hut later that afternoon. So an incredible effort by the rescue team that got Bob down with just, just over 24 hours he'd spent at above 5,000 metres. A uh, helicopter was able to be called. The helicopter took him to Inyeri, uh, which is at about 1,700 metres, and he was able to walk off the helicopter. He woke up, and at 1,700 metres, his symptoms had vanished. Now, that's not dehydration. That's not a cold. That's not caffeine withdrawal. That is acute mountain sickness. That incredible recovery in just a few minutes from being almost semi-conscious and able to stand to being able to walk to the walk to the ambulance be seen in the hospital and be discharged an hour later and finding yourselves in a in a hotel uh, later that day symptom free that's acute mountain sickness and uh, credit to the team who rescued him without their help uh, there's a very real chance that bob would never have made it uh, and, and would have died on the mountain so there are really three clues there that this was acute mountain sickness. The ascent rates that I showed you at the start of the, uh, the presentation, the symptoms, these were classic acute mountain sickness symptoms. And most importantly, they worsened with height. AMS gets worse uh, and it doesn't get better. Uh, and they were very lucky to survive. So I'll stop there and I'll hand back to David. Thanks, David. Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you very much for that case. Um, our next speaker is uh, Chris Imray. Um, Chris he has summited, he, well, he completed the seven summits in 2019, um, but is also an active rock climber, particularly says he enjoys climbing on Mingale and Parabé. Uh, Pabé. I, uh, last routes I did with him was Groove Direct, where we were trying to do it in tweeds and things followed by Lockwood's Chimney the next day on a stag weekend based in Hellig. Um, he has a dubious distinction. In, on Everest in 2007, uh, he had a blood sample taken from above 8,000 meters. This was taken by his uh, friends, companions, from his, an artery in his groin. They did it to each other. Doctors are like that. And he has the, had the second lowest recorded oxygen, arterial oxygen measurement in a, a live person. Quite a distinction. Um, and despite this, or possibly because of it, he's managed to work at professorial level as a vascular surgeon um, and is also on the MEF screening committee. Um, he's ideal with being a vascular surgeon, although we try and avoid using his surgical skills. He's one of three members of the uh, UK Frostbite Advice Service, run in conjunction with the BMC, with Paul and myself. So for a few words on the dreaded cold digits on a bivy, uh, we hand over to Chris. Chris, are you there? I am indeed, thank you very much indeed. And it's a great pleasure to come and talk uh, to all of you at the Alpine Club. Um, I'm going to talk to you about frostbite. Um, I've been given a little bit of an introduction. Um, in terms of my own background, I've written quite a few papers on uh, cold and altitude and a couple of books as well. We've, as uh, Dave explained, run the uh, BMC uh, telemedicine service uh, for over a decade. But far more relevant to this talk is the photographs that I took this morning of my digits. I feel that uh, I can demonstrate that I am able to look after myself so far in difficult circumstances. What am I going to talk about? What is frostbite? What's the sort of setting? How do you get it? Um, I'm going to focus on what you can do 
um, about uh, a developing frostbite on a route, then a little bit on secondary or hospital treatment and how to avoid it. So without further ado, let's get on with it. So what is frostbite? You can see uh, that in the picture there, um, a series of hands taken over a number, of, well, two hands and fingers taken over 10 days. And you can see the, the way it's developed from some blistering on day one through to day seven, where you can see some tissue damage. What you've got is a reduced blood flow because of the peripheral vasoconstriction from cold. And this results in sludging of the microcirculation. It's often numb. Uh, and then this, because of the lack of flow to it, you start to get tissue death. And fr uh, frostbite is an irreversible freezing injury to the extremities. There is a slight caveat to that in that uh, there's now evidence that frostbite may at least be partially irreversible if treated within 24 to 48 hours. And we'll talk about that briefly. A couple more photographs. This is taken in about 24 hours. And this is the same chap um, 14 days later. And you can see the demarcation and the way in which those bits of tissue that haven't got an oxygen supply die. So how would you get it? Well, I first read about it um, as a teenager, reading about Annapurna and Morris Herzog's famous retreat from the summit. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. And he went on to uh, have a successful career as a politician, but his retreat from uh, Annapurna was really quite a ghastly occasion. A little bit of um, physics. It's based on the second law of thermodynamics. And very simply, if you put a, a cup of tea on the counter, it will get cold and it will not under any circumstances unless you put it in the microwave warm up and that's essentially what's happening heat is flowing spontaneously from a higher temperature to a lower temperature region and if we look at the ways in which you lose heat um, in the mountains or anywhere else it's through these four different mechanisms convection evaporation radiation and conduction and when you're sitting on that bivy you need to start to think about how you might mitigate these losses this is a infrared thermography photograph um, that was taken in fact recently in Norway and you can see how the faces are uh, putting out a lot of heat and interesting also the thighs and to a certain extent the uh, feet. There are a number of risk factors for developing frostbite, the primary one being temperature but also wind chill is very significant and if you're wet uh, you lose heat more quickly. Altitude something and I'll talk about that in the next slide but also equipment. There's quite a lot of very good equipment out there, but one of the problems is people don't necessarily use it very well. So first of all, you need to have it and then you need to use it appropriately. Nutrition and hydration can be problems. We heard on the last talk from Jeremy about hydration, but nutrition on particularly some of the bigger um, Himalayan routes, such as uh, the Bazino Ridge last week, becomes a really big issue. And the duration of exposure, and then some individuals seem to be more resistant to cold than others. This was a study done by our medical students at Warwick Medical School. Uh, they were, took a number of individuals and put them into a hypoxic chamber in Birmingham. Uh, and you can see here the perfusion of the hands appears to be pretty normal in Birmingham. And then as they pumped out the oxygen, gradually increasing the altitude to the summit of Tukval, which was where their expedition was, you can see how the periphery shut down. And this is as a result of breathing more quickly blowing off carbon dioxide and vasoconstricting. And then on returning to uh, normal oxygen levels, the hands warm up. And the temperature didn't change in that chamber for the entire time. So you can see the effect of hypoxia on peripheral circulation quite graphically there. So let's get on to this bivy. Um, that what can you do about it? You've got a balance here between heat generation and heat loss. We've talked about the way in which you lose heat, so you need to think about behavioural issues, how you might mitigate the losses. So you might have some shelter with you, get inside a, a group shelter or into a tent. You need to start thinking about whether you've got all your um, um, appropriate clothing on and if there's anything wet, remove those. If you're sitting in a harness, is there any way you can get out of the harness because that will be restricting the flow to your legs. You might be able to sit on the ropes to get you so yourself some insulation. Optimise your clothing. We've talked about the gloves and mitts. Think about external heat sources. Sometimes you can get warmth either from chemical uh, hand warmers or electrical ones. Uh, the other thing that you might think about um, is getting a brew on and we'll talk about it in the metabolic. And then finally descent. Uh, you need to get off that mountain if at all possible. So that's the way in which you could reduce heat loss. The other way of thinking about it is how you can generate heat and this would be um, taking in some hot sweet fluids, get a brew on as I said, eat some food, 
uh, your body, in order to generate heat, needs um, a source of energy. So if, you're, if you are hungry and you haven't eaten for hours, that's a problem. You can generate heat by exercising at extreme altitude. That's ex very difficult, but at modest al altitudes, that might be reasonable. If we go back to extreme altitude, the other thing that you could do is take um, oxygen. So you might, if you've got a supply, you might turn it up, or if there's some available, get hold of it. So what else could, can you do? Secondary or uh, further treatment? Well, you need to try to gently warm up the areas uh, that are concerned. Um, ideally, you're putting it into water baths at uh, roughly baby bath temperature, so somewhere around 39 degrees centigrade. Simple non-adherent dressings, and then using creams like aloe vera, which is, has an anti-prostaglandin effect, or ibuprofen. And then if you've got breaks in the skin, you need to think about tetanus toxide. The big issue that really, if I can get across to the audience, is wait before any surgery. There's a huge enthusiasm uh, of surgeons, uh, and I speak as a surgeon, uh, inexperienced surgeons who haven't seen one think it would be quite interesting to get on. It's a young, fit patient, which they haven't seen for years, and they offer an early amputation. Uh, and this can be catastrophic, so wait. You really shouldn't be thinking about doing anything for the first six to 12 weeks. And I'm gonna talk briefly about the um, British Mountaineering Council uh, frostbite service, which we've now been running for 15 or so years. So traditional surgical approach. Um, this is Tishi on descending from um, Chioyoyu. You can see someone's very kindly offering him a cigarette to smoke. This is not a good idea. This is a South Korean climber who got into trouble at about 7,500 meters. And if you look at her uh, left hand, you can see that there's demarcation occurring there. That doesn't look too bad, but if you look at the same hand some two months later, you can see that there was a catastrophic injury there that would completely transform her life um, and how she might live. So what else could, could be done as an alternative? We've talked about the BMC Internet Frostbite Service. This is something that David, Paul and I have been running for a, a, a while now, and you can get uh, access to this. It's free. Uh, and between us, we will offer advice, um, usually within 24 to 48 hours. If you had serious frostbite and you can get to help within two to, uh, 24 to 48 hours, then you need to consider thrombolysis. This is using the same drugs that would be used to treat an acute heart attack or an acute stroke to clear the clot. And with that, you can actually open up the vessels. And this is a lady that actually was involved in a um, road traffic uh, breakdown in Minnesota, got very cold. There's no perfusion to the tips of her toes. You can see the blood flowing on this angiogram, but there's nothing here. After 24 hours of thrombolysis, you can see the end result is a well perfused foot uh, and she was able to, we, it was possible to save her toes. So this sort of treatment is now available, but clearly you need to think about how you can get help. It used to be that this was only available um, in uh, Europe and North America, but now the CWEP clinic is offering this in uh, Kathmandu. So again, if you can get yourself down quickly, we, the treatment can be started. So prevention, how do you avoid pr uh, uh, frostbite? Bite? I've talked a bit about kit, and as a surgeon using my hands to earn my living, I'm particularly concerned with my fingers. And this uh, is the sort of um, kit that I used um, both on Everest uh, and on Vincent. And you can see here a range of gloves uh, getting onto mitts, spare mitts, hand warmers. All the gloves have got hand sewn in um, idiot loops so I can't lose them. Fresh pair of socks so they're nice and clean, electric heated um, inner, uh, inners and 8,000 meter boots. And that's just the, for the extremities. You then need to think about how you're going to keep the core warm. Also the kit you're going to use in terms of whether it's your tent, your stove and so on. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but you need to think very carefully about what you, you're going to do. The other thing is about behaviours and one of the problems about people going into the mountains um, without a great deal of experience is they can run into trouble. This individual ran into trouble actually on an Everest um, summit day. Uh, he left thinking that he'd only got a pair of gauntlets. In fact, uh, and that he left his mitts in his tent. In fact, his uh, mitts were in, in the um, top of his rucksack, but he didn't think to look there. He came down, uh, ran into big trouble. He came in fact back to the UK and this was us um, operating, taking off the digits. Clearly it was affecting both hands. He would be absolutely limited in what he could do because we would probably need to take the hand at this point here. But by burying the hand inside the belly for a month, 
it was then possible to bring it out, having revascularized this necrotic bone here. And in fact, he went on to climb the Matterhorn uh, uh, 12 months later, much against our advice, but that's a different matter. Um, so what further resources could you use if you run into trouble? Well, I've talked about the BMC um, Frostbite Advice Service. You can look that up on the internet now. You'll, you'll get hold of our uh, details and we'd be happy to help. I trust no one with a lockdown is suffering from frostbite at the moment. And then there are a couple of open access papers you might find helpful that you, you just type the names in, um, either the Wilderness Medical Society um, practice guidelines on frostbite, or there's this one on the um, pro practical um, approach to hospital management, both of which are um, freely downloadable. Um, I'm going to stop at that point and hand back to um, David. Um, and thank you very much indeed for giving me the opportunity of talking to you. Chris, thanks ever so much. Um, I love that picture of you relying on alcohol to vasodilate after uh, after an ascent I think of Everest but um, I'm sure although alcohol doesn't actually help it makes you feel better about your frostbite. Um, many of you will have been on expeditions to the greater ranges and it's interesting hearing about the altitude, it's interesting hearing about frostbite, the dramatic things, the things that make the headlines but we all know the thing that can really ruin an expedition decimate a team is an attack of the shit and we happen to have our, our resident expert on this here paul richards uh, is a gp he too was a researcher on choe and the everest expeditions but has also got experience in deserts and rainforests so to deal with this horribly common problem over to you paul Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, David, for that introduction, and thank you to the Alpine Club for um, this invitation to talk a little bit and give you a flavour of the, uh, the issues about diarrhoea in remote environments, or uh, as David mentioned earlier, uh, talking crap as usual. So, most of you know what traveller's diarrhoea is, because I dare say most of us here have actually had it. It's clearly a diarrheal illness that you acquire whilst travelling. But why do we get it? and what places are you more likely to get to, and more importantly, what can we do about it? Now, this is looking at general travellers, not particularly expeditioners, and you can see that the rate of getting travellers diarrhoea in countries such as the UK, if you travel in the UK, is about 2% or so. It's quite low in the uh, more affluent areas of the world, like North America and Australia, etc. Um, more prevalent in other parts of the world and of course the hot spots are the hot tropical humid areas with uh, relatively poor economies, poor infrastructure, hygiene and water supplies. So it's particularly common in Africa, Central Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, Central America and parts of, uh, of South America. And hence the risk is broadly related to the socio-economic uh, status of the country and in these countries it can be as much as 40 or 50 percent depending on your activity there. Uh, it used to be considered to be more 65 percent plus but over the last 20 years few studies have actually showed an instance greater than 50 percent and that really reflects the growing economies in many of these countries and improvement in the tourist uh, uh, um, infrastructure. Now there is a dizzying array of organisms which can uh, give you diarrhea, as you probably know. Uh, everyone has heard of norovirus, particularly notorious for causing outbreaks in closed environments such as cruise ships. Uh, notice coronavirus is in there as well, uh, not the current one, although there is some GI problems with that. Uh, but a lot of the uh, diarrheas are actually caused by bacteria, particularly in hot, humid environments with problems with hygiene. Uh, some of these are actually quite invasive, some of the E. coli's are quite invasive, particularly Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonellas. And what do we mean by invasive? We mean that it just doesn't alter the fluid balance into and out of the gut, giving you loose motions. They actually invade the gut wall, start causing an immune reaction, inflammation, so you get bleeding and pus in, in the stools. Uh, and general systemic symptoms, often high temperatures, abdominal pain, often quite acute onset as well. Uh, and that is known as dysentery, which you definitely do not want. And we know from studies that uh, 
in some parts of the world, Southeast Asia and Latin America particularly, 70 to 80 percent of these diarrheas are definitely caused by bacterial organisms and sometimes more than one. So you know this I'm sure. Why do you get diarrhea? It's because these organisms inhabit the guts of animals or people and for some reason they end up in your mouth. Now this is usually because of poor hygiene as we mentioned, not washing hands, and of course we're now all experts in washing hands, not washing hands after defecation, not washing hands before eating, not washing hands before preparing food, contamination of water supplies, and in some parts of the world there's a custom of using human feces as a fertilizer, so-called night soil, which of course contaminates food substances, which if they're not prepared properly, can then lead on to, uh, to diarrhea. This is a quite illustrative slide uh, provided by the Tear Fund, which is quite useful. Um, presentation, probably most of you have had a couple of these. Many of them are just uh, watery diarrhea, not specific, maybe some nausea, a little bit of vomiting, abdominal pain, perhaps a little bit of colic, not too bad. Uh, most people can cope with it. And of course then there's the bacterial dysenteries, much more significant, much more ill, high temperatures, abdominal pain, uh, the, the blood and the mucus you may not see initially, just be aware of that. And then there's a, a, a few others such as uh, the slow more burning ones, uh, parasitic organisms, protozoa like Giardia and Amoeba, which tend to drag on a little bit. And there's also the classic food poisoning where it's not so much the actual bacteria that's been ingested, it's a preformed toxin in the food. So the onset is really quite rapid, one to five hours, and then you're throwing up and, and diarrhea often at the same time, and, and just at the point where you, you're thinking that you really can't stand this anymore, about 12 hours later, it, it switches off. And also be mindful that there are other causes of diarrhea, just because you happen to be traveling, this could be your first case of colitis or Crohn's, even uh, malaria can cause diarrhea, so, so just be aware of that. So what do we do about this? Well most of them will actually settle as you probably experience bacteria three days up to a week maybe viruses a little less to so say the protozoas can go on a little bit longer um, incidentally the post travel irritable bowel syndrome is said to be at 1.5 percent but if it's a particularly severe traveler's diarrhea and prolonged that can be a lot higher almost as 10 percent so imagine you're at camp one say Pomori or somewhere similar you've got the squirts just as you've got into your sleeping bag uh, you're really self-reliant and traveler's diarrhea in remote environments is one of these illnesses where really the uh, the victim the diagnostician and the therapist are all the same person because there's just you and perhaps a friend and one would hope that you'd uh, given some forethought to this so you've kitted out your medical kit and because most of these depending on where you are are likely to be bacterial there's an argument for using antibiotics and indeed that has been the case and in fact Antibiotics have been used prophylactically for many years. Uh, but the problem with that, of course, is that the more they're used prophylactically, then uh, the more resistance occurs. And so the general trend now is to avoid people taking them prophylactically, but to use them as standby if you can't get access to medical help in the next 24 hours, and particularly if you're deteriorating. So we really need some sort of idea uh, of how, how bad is this diarrhea? So do I need to use antibiotics now or do, can I wait or what? And the classic grading of diarrhea, mostly for research purposes really, was just on the frequency of stools, where if it was six or nine times a day, it was classified as severe. The problem with that is that uh, you may have only one or two or three stools a day, but can be really quite unwell with it, with fever and abdominal pain and, and, and prostration. So there was a meeting of experts commissioned by the International Society of Travel Medicine in 2017, who came up with a, a much more useful in the field grading system. And this has subsequently been uh, adopted by our own uh, NICE. Uh, NICE give a very a balanced view of this actually, it's well worth a read. And the new grading system is that Traveller's diarrhea is a sudden onset of abnormally loose or liquid freak, uh, frequent stools, which in the victim's assessment is mild, so it's tolerable, not causing much distress, not forcing a change in plans. Moderate, oh, this is getting uncomfortable, it's interfering with travel, oh, I don't think I'll take that bus, I can't quite trust the farts. All the way through to severe, yeah, I'm not leaving the sleeping bag, I'm just absolutely not up for doing anything at all. And dysentery, that's with the blood and the mucus and often high fever, by definition is, is severe. So that's a much more useful in the field 
So what treatments are available to us if we're out uh, on, uh, on a bivy or on a base camp somewhere? Clearly, hydration is important. Um, now, judging hydration, clearly if you're thirsty, you can uh, assume that you're pretty uh, dry. Uh, but it's said uh, traditionally that thirst is satiated fairly quickly by, by frequent drinking. Uh, that thinking has changed slightly, but it is useful to look at your urine, as you know. If it's like tea, it's going to be quite concentrated, you're probably dehydrated. If it's fairly clear after the first run of the day, you're probably fairly hydrated. The problem is that water on its own is not efficiently absorbed from the bowel. It has to be linked to a glucose molecule. Uh, so it is important to be able to eat some form of carbohydrate. This could be something like uh, rice or uh, biscuits or bread or mashed potato or anything you have really. Uh, if you have bananas, they're quite a useful form of carbohydrate. It almost looks like a, like a dietary fiber. Uh, it gets through to the larger gut. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you can't tolerate any of those, there are official ORS, oral rehydration solutions. And I'm sure that uh, many people here have tried these. Every country has its own particular version of varying degrees of palatability. Most are based on the World Health Organization recipe. Anti-motility agents such as loperamide, that's the uh, probably the most efficacious one. It's well tolerated, it's rapid acting, uh, usually in one to two hours. But bear that in mind, the dosing is two capsules, that's four milligram with the first diarrhea, and then the instructions are one further capsule of two milligram with every diarrhea. Uh, up to a total of eight capsules, 16 milligrams a day. Uh, just be mindful, it does take one to two hours to work. So, uh, you know, if you've got diarrhea four times in that, you don't take four doses, just give it a little bit of time to work. It's well tolerated and it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Not licensed in children in most countries, though the BNF does, does list children's doses. Antiemetics are not in this current guidance, but I usually take something like Buckerstem, which is a um, a buccal version of prochlorperazine because the, the tablet version is all very well but if you're vomiting you can easily vomit the tablet back. This handily dissolves underneath the top lip so you do need some moisture on your, on your mouth membranes otherwise it won't dissolve and the advantage of this is that if you are vomiting you can simply press your, your gum over it and, uh, and vomit past it basically so they're quite useful. And then we come to antibiotics. Now Traditional antibiotics such as uh, doxycycline, which were and still are used for malaria prophylaxis, previously had the advantage that they were prophylactic against travellers' diarrhoea. Unfortunately, because of sustained use over many years, that is not the case anymore. And until recently, ciprofloxacin was the antibiotic of choice to the extent that it was mentioned in the Lonely Planet Guide. It's available in supermarkets for one or two dollars in places like Kathmandu. So it was extensively used throughout Southeast Asia and consequently invasive organisms like Campylobacter, which is one of the more common diarrheal organisms there, have now become resistant and this resistance is spreading. Additionally, uh, in 2017, 2018, there was an alert from the European Medicines Agency that there are reported cases of life-changing side effects with quinolones, of which this is one, where uh, tendons can snap. So it's really not to be used in people with tendinopathies, and that might include uh, people of uh, more elderly years, certainly over 60, or people on steroids or, or diabetics. So it's now lost its UK license for use in travellers' diarrhoea. So we're not really uh, using that. It can still be used in other parts of the world where they don't have such a degree of uh, ciprofloxacin resistance. The antibiotic of choice now is azithromycin, which uh, doesn't actually have a, a UK license, but it is recognized by NICE and uh, ISTM at 500 milligrams once a day. And of course, you have to give some thought to evacuation. You shouldn't really be leaving without knowing how you're going to get back and give some thought to how you would get off this mountain, a bit like the, uh, the Kenya case you just heard, uh, and uh, insurance to enable and facilitate that. So when would you use these antibiotics? Again, using the uh, modern classification, which is more useful, it's a self-determination score everyone to rehydrate but if it's mild not distressing not really interfering with activities you expect it to get better you may use the paramide say for that bus journey or just so you can sleep at night but it's, it's not obligatory more significant moderate diarrhea you may use the paramide on its own or you could use it with antibiotics depending on how badly you feel 
but for severe incapacitating diarrhea, when it just stops you from doing anything that you plan to do, you should really be considering antibiotics in a remote area. Different, of course, if you're on holiday in, in Tenerife or a resort, you can easily get to, to healthcare. But in our circumstances of remote uh, field use, antibiotics uh, I would recommend to be part of your available medical kit. Now, if you don't see blood and pus and it's not high fever, you can consider using loperamide as an adjunct. It's not recommended for use if there is dysentery, and that is because there is at least a theoretical ris uh, risk of toxic megacolon. Although a lot of that worry does seem to arise out of a, a single small study in the 1970s where, uh, where, where use of lomital, as it was then, uh, prolonged diarrhea with shigella. But nevertheless, that is the, the recommendation currently. And uh, do remember that it is a communicable disease, so socially distance defecation, please. And uh, if anyone wants to read up any further about this, NAVNAC, which is the UK Public Health England Ad Travel Advisory Service, National Travel Health Network and Centre, uh, it's free advice, easily obtained. Um, you can look at these uh, advice guidelines from the ISTM. I was going to put the URL down, but it was uh, too long, I want to copy down. But if you simply Google Traveller's Diarrhea by the author Mark Riddle, or there's a, an easier to read version by Bradley Connor, available on the American CDC. So that's pretty much a gallop uh, through diarrhea. So um, I'll uh, pass you back to David and um, hope for some questions. Paul, well, thank you very much. That's uh, a great help. Um, thank you to all our, uh, all our contributors. That's absolutely excellent. Um, Nigel, I hope we've had some questions come in. Uh, we have two from YouTube, David. Um, shall right. I kick off? Yes, if you could, and I'll try and steer them towards the right people. Um, so, uh, I, actually, I can, I can steer this to the right person. It's for Jeremy, um, and it's from Jules on YouTube. Um, how much of dehydration contribute to AMS? Would Bob possibly not have ended up in such a bad state if he'd been well hydrated? Yes, I think that's true. I think dehydration can be a real risk factor for acute mountain sickness. It's worth bearing in mind, though, that the converse isn't necessarily the case. Too much fluid isn't going to protect you from acute mountain sickness. And in fact, part of the acclimatization process is that you lose fluid in the first two to three days at altitude. So, in fact, a small loss of fluid is actually helpful uh, to the acclimatization process. But yes, in general, dehydration, uh, a risk factor for acute mountain sickness. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. That's great. And whilst we're on uh, fluid, a uh, question came in via YouTube um, saying that uh, the person had heard that it's positively dangerous to drink glacial water because of the uh, micro particles in it. I'm sure most of us have come down off routes crossing glaciers absolutely gasping for a drink and have just sucked it out of the nearest pool we can find. Um, and I've survived. I, I hardly have any problems at all, but um, I don't know, Paul, could I ask you what your views are on that? Yes, thank you, David. Can you hear me better now? Uh, that is better, actually. It is better, okay. Yeah. Uh, a couple of things about that. It, it's it, Glaciers form by successive layers of, of snow and ice compacting down. Of course, they take all the debris and the dead animals and things with them. So there's two components to this. There is the grinding up of all the rock as the glacier moves and you get this very fine, almost talcum powder like, like precipitates in the water. And that's said to have a, an appearance effect on the bowel, uh, which can cause a sort of um, physical diarrhea, if you like. Uh, so there's some merit in perhaps trying to uh, filter that out if you can. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, glaciers are not exactly sterile. They, they represent what was happening in the environment of the snow at the time. And any dead animals and things or um, other organic matter that was encompassed in it will be rotted away and be taken down with the glacier. And of course, just like any water flow, it's, it's the human and animal activity in the watershed that's, that's uh, important. So if you're taking it from a glacial outflow and you're beho below the, the, the mountaineering hut above you, you're going to have to expect there's a, a certain um, organism load in it. So it depends on where you are as always. Having said that, I suspect there's not many people here that haven't 
drunk glacial meltwater. Does that answer the question or just confuse things more? Uh, well, like anything medical, Paul, um, we usually manage to confuse it. Um, having the number of doctors we've got here, we should be able to disagree on most the, things. The, the point I've, is about how you sterilise that water from that position of drawing it, I guess. Yep, and someone has asked, um, is there any type of water filter recommended? And this is, um, well, on a diploma level course, we can discuss this for hours. At my personal level, if I've got one, I like to filter water through a coarse filter, a mill bank bag to get rid of the big lumps. And I'm a great believer in uh, iodine to uh, make it drinkable. But we all have our favorites. I don't know if anyone else in the medical group. And I noticed that George Wobway is out there from the USA. And I noticed that Jim Millage is with us as well. So there's quite a lot of expertise in the audience. I don't know if anyone else would like to comment on that. To filter out those small particles of rocker things, you need a sort of 0.2 micron filter, but the problem with the filter and doing that, it will clog very quickly and you'll spend all your time scrubbing the filter, uh, particularly if it's a ceramic one or replacing your filters. Um, the, the mill bank bag will get rid of all the sort of larger debris, but not the very tiny things. And of course it doesn't filter out um, large, uh, the bacteria and it certainly doesn't filter out viruses. There's a question or a, a comment from uh, Alex Metcalf saying, can UV light kill most harmful particles in the water? It can certainly uh, kill most uh, of the bugs uh, as long as it's not too silty and it can work. So I, I think UV is a good, good solution, mm. particularly in North America. We did have a question in saying that some of the drugs, uh, well, that uh, they believe, the person believed there were some similarities between high altitude pulmonary edema mm. and COVID pneumonia. Now, um, I've got some very strong views on this and I know others have, um, but could the drugs be used that are used for high altitude pulmonary edema to buy time for descent? And I say to buy time for descent, not instead of descent, be used. Uh, Jeremy, can I throw that one your way? Well, I thought something like this would come up, so I'm prepared with a diagram. <laughs> diagram. Oh dear. So, everybody, healthy lung, okay? Yellow, nice healthy lung. Alveolus at the bottom. Blue blood becomes red blood. That's good. This is high altitude pulmonary edema. Massive swelling of the blood vessels around the alveolus causes lots of breakdown of the alveolar capillary membrane. But everything else is pretty much intact. The damage goes on down here. Now, COVID-19, which is what I spend most of my day treating, looks like this. This is massive catastrophic breakdown of the epithelial lining of the lung. At the same time, you get massive inflammation, huge amounts of swelling in the interstitial spaces. And these airways collapse, leaving you with pretty much a destroyed alveolus, which is what I spend, I spent the last six weeks treating. This is very different to high altitude pulmonary edema. You might get similar symptoms. You might be breathless, you might have low SATs, uh, you might have a cough, but they're two very different pathologies. And I think it's fair to say, Jeremy, if you use drugs that we use for pulmonary edema at altitude to buy time, you'll most likely kill your patient. <laughs> right. Um, I notice, Nigel, we've got some hands up in the audience. Derek's we do. always reliable. But, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll unmute Derek now. Uh, he's already unmuted. Are you there, Derek? Yeah, I am. Thanks very much. Well, thanks very much, fellas. I, you've, you've sort of covered a lot of major issues there. I mean, one point I would what is one point I was going to make, and then I can come back to the one about filtration of fluids and all the rest of it, you know, for, for making sure they're they're clean to drink. But my my policy has always been with altitude. I mean, often people do get headaches, you know, even, even people that aren't climbing too much at any one time. And often you find you fly into a high altitude area. For example, you fly into um, somewhere like Laster, or you fly into uh, um, the capital of uh, Bolivia and 
that gives you a problem. So my, my approach has always been, don't climb at all until your headache is controllable and preferably gone. Um, it's something you didn't actually mention, Jeremy, and, but I think this is quite important. If people are still climbing up when they've got a stonking headache, I think they're looking forward to trouble. Would you like to just comment on that, please? No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I'm sorry if it didn't come through in the presentation, but yes, once a headache starts, it's not going to stop by going higher, for sure. And, you know, we should take it as, a, uh, as an early warning sign that our body is not coping with the, uh, the altitude that it's exposed to. The problem I think we're faced with is often we confuse headaches with so many other conditions and we almost talk ourselves out of the fact that it's actually AMS. But I think you're right, Derek, that we should all have a very low threshold that if we get a headache, we should assume that's uh, an acute mountain sickness headache until proven otherwise at altitude. Thank you. Chris, I, uh, I know you've got a particular interest in, um, in circulation in the brain and things. Um, I think your PhD was on something along these lines. Um, would you like to put some comments in there as well? In terms of headaches? in terms of headaches or any other gems you wish to share with us? So headaches are very common uh, and trying to distinguish um, a just an exercise headache from a high altitude headache from early acute mountain sickness right the way through to haste remains a challenge which uh, we still are trying to fully address. Um, what Jeremy has just said is if in the absence of any other uh, really compelling reason for a headache, you have a headache, it's likely to be mountain sickness if you've ascended recently. And you need to take the approach that you're going down or at least not going any higher until you address it. In terms of the mechanisms, very happy to go into all of those, but I think it's probably not the right place. I think you'd all be bored silly. Um, but would be happy to not have an offline discussion with people on that. Um, Lovely, thanks, Chris. Uh, I would say that, uh... Some people may have very technical questions which might bore some of the rest of the audience. We're very happy to stay on afterwards and um, to, to answer some of those in a less formal setting. Um, now, uh, Nigel, have you got any other questions that are coming in? Um, there's a few more here. There's a, a question from Ross. Um, are you there, Ross? Hi, uh, yep. Hi, uh, it's actually my question, which was that you, um, one of the speakers talked about stitching the frostbite wounds into the abdomen um, to help them heal. And I've heard of them doing that with um, sort of pieces of skull when they do sort of um, craniotomies and decompressing brain injuries. But I've never heard of it being done with just like a, an amputation wound. And I was wondering why, they, why they've done that. Um, this is certainly one for Chris. I think it was a technique used in the First World War initially, wasn't it, Chris? Yes, um, it's not previously been described in frostbite. What you're doing is using the blood supply from the abdominal wall to revascularize the uh, dead bone. What it allowed us to do was to preserve the length of the digits. So if we hadn't done that, we'd have had to take off the dead bone and that would then have uh, resulted in a dysfunctional hand. Um, so it was an interesting idea. Matt Venus is the plastic surgeon I work with. He said, what about it? And um, the guy was in a very tight position um, and we thought it was worth doing. We in fact chose not to do his other hand. He was right hand dominant and uh, he didn't speak any English. So he communicated using an iPhone and we, he wanted one hand for the month to communicate with. Uh, so we chose to put his dominant hand into the, his tummy and was he was able to uh, use his left hand for communicating. It's an interesting thing. It's not often done, obviously, but uh, it just shows you, I think, and what I, what I wanted to illustrate was why, if you've got a complicated problem, it's well worth seeking the advice of a multidisciplinary team where they've got a full range of um, skills in their armamentarian. Uh, we're, certainly, we're not the only unit that we could do things like that, but it does help if you have a team that think uh, along those lines, not infrequently. Thank you for the question. And I think it's fair to say with any medical problem related to the mountains, it's really useful to have an active mountaineer in the, uh, in the team treating you. And a lot of our work is translating mountaineers' needs uh, to help non-mountaineering doctors look after them. <laughs> 
Um, I notice a hand was raised by Mike there. Um, yep. Would you like to come in, Mike? Yep, okay. Um, question really about acclimatization. Um, yep. Some decades ago, in fact, more decades ago than I care to remember, I found myself climbing with somebody who had obviously acclimatized better than I had. And I mentioned this to him, and he replied rather sheepishly, uh, I've, oh, I've been spending a bit of time at the RAE Farnborough in the decompression chamber. Uh, nowadays, this does not, well, this isn't available to most people. And nowadays, I hear that people go into tents and you change the partial pressure of the oxygen by just pumping in more nitrogen. Are these two situations equivalent? Namely, the decompression chamber, which obviously emulates the mountain environment entirely or is that equivalent to the tent where you just change the ratio of nitrogen and oxygen and lower the partial pressure of the oxygen to correspond to the altitude you want are those two situations equivalent um mike if no one else objects i'm going to come in on this because it's something i feel quite strongly about and the uia medical commission had a meeting about this recently in view of some of these very rapid ascents of Everest costing an awful lot of money for people who haven't actually most likely done much climbing before um, but uh, they carry double the normal amount of oxygen and uh, they're sticking their necks out and I spoke with several of the people organizing these trips and several elite Himalayan climbers who think these things are great. Um, my one of the things I think sums it up extremely well for the average mountaineer is there is a centre in London, which I'm prepared to name, called the Altitude Centre, which for quite a lot of money will set you up with this sort of thing. Um, this is uh, normobaric, normal pressure, sea level, hypoxia, lack of oxygen, as you say, as opposed to what we actually experience in the mountain, which is hypobaric hypoxia. But Chris, I think you wanted to say something there. Yes, I mean, you're absolutely right to be cynical. However, the, if you ask the question, can you simulate altitude by giving a nitrogen rich mixture, the answer is yes. We're currently running a phase one study, or at least we were until the outbreak, looking at um, whether or not dexamethasone works to prevent high altitude cerebral edema. And we're using a number of uh, these hypoxicators and they generate acute mountain sickness very well. So. Going back to Mike's original question, you could theoretically use it. One of the problems is how many hours a day are you going to do it? How high are you going to do it to go? And uh, how long will the uh, mild acclimatization last for? So it means you've got a real problem as to whether you're truly acclimatized or not. And I think without any of those sort of dose response curves and so on, it's a, quite a dangerous approach. And certainly I would advocate a much uh, spending a bit more time uh, in the greater ranges rather than trying to artificially acclimatise in a somewhat uh, unpredictable fashion. Uh, Chris, I mean, I totally agree with you. And yes, I have got a very cynical approach because I'm cynical to people who don't base it on science. Um, and I think the answer is the jury is out and it may make a slight difference to some super fit, uh, really experienced uh, high altitude alpinists. And I'll certainly accept that. Um, now, um, what I would say that in Bolzano now in northern Italy, they have a thing called the Terra X cube. This is a chamber large enough to drive more than a large piste basher into. And you can alter the wind speed, you can alter the precipitation, you can alter the altitude, you can alter the pressure, you can alter the gas mixture going in. And you can keep people in it. It has showers and toilets for many days. And this is the sort of environment where research is going to come from, which will actually give us answers to this. For the average mountaineer going to the Himalayas, I'd suggest you fly out two or three days earlier and go uphill a little bit slower, enjoying the culture, rather than waste your money on a tent in bed at home. Um, let's have some more comments. Shoot me down, please. David, can I come in? 
Yes, do. I, I agree with what you say, but the reality is, I think, that this is the future. That I think we will see over the next 10, 20, 30 years, people wanting to do shorter trips to the greater ranges and want to find ways to do that safely and successfully. And although I agree with you know, everything that you say, and I think slower climatization in the mountain, in the countryside is the way to go, I think as a medical profession, we will have to work alongside and with these people who are trying these approaches. I, I, I mean, I think it, it's a fantastic opportunity to study people in, in the mountains and extreme environments. It's something that we will have to work with in the future. Great. We've, uh, we've managed to get a little bit of disagreement, but not really between us. Um, but I've been asked to go back because I believe Nigel's got some more questions coming in. Yeah. And our time is going to be limited. Got a few more questions from YouTube. Um, we have a question from Don, um, and it's for Chris. Is there any evidence for Raynaud's syndrome being linked to a worsening frostbite? That's a great question, uh, and I'm not sure I can answer it. What I do know is that people with bad Raynaud's tend to be very cautious about what they do. They've learned uh, what they can and can't do. There's some evidence that taking certain drugs like nifedipine will mitigate this. Um, and certainly when we did Denali, a couple of the team had quite bad Raynaud's and decided, despite the, the nifedipine, they weren't happy to continue on the last day. Um, so I think there is weak evidence that Raynaud's um, would increase the risk, but it's not no stronger than that. Raynaud's is a vasospastic, it's a shutting down from a spasm rather than a blocking off from sludging of the vessel. So they're, they're slightly different mechanisms. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Nigel, any more questions yeah. flooding uh, in? We've got a question from Rebecca. Um, does experiencing AMS increase your risk of developing AMS again? And if so, would you recommend taking a uh, prophylaxis? Shall we go to Jeremy for that one? So just to break that down, I, I think that, yes, there's probably some evidence that supports the idea that the more you go back to altitude, the less risk you have of AMS. And there's probably some learned behavior there in that people learn ways to help their bodies acclimatize. I think as we get older, we go slower and more carefully. We pick different objectives and therefore we may get uh, less AMS. In terms of prophylaxis, I've got to be honest, I'm not a big fan. Uh, the, the commonest drug that's used, acetazolamide, uh, gives a whole host of side effects to themselves. In fact, if you look at the side effect profile of acetazolamide, the first five or six symptoms of, the, of side effects are AMS symptoms. So you could quite easily get headache, nausea, uh, fatigue, and lightheadedness from taking acetazolamide. Uh, it's not necessarily working. There's evidence that it works. Yes, it reduces your risk of developing AMS by about a third when you go to between four and 5,000 meters, it, it does work, but it comes with side effects. And going back to David's point, for the sake of just a few more days on the mountain, uh, taking it carefully, you can avoid acute mountain sickness and its complications. Jeremy, do you think there's any, any legs in the tight box theory? Um, as, you, as your brain shrinks with age, there's actually more room for things to swell and buffer any cerebral swelling? <laughs> um, I asked this because I recently had an MRI that uh, apparently was reported as normal uh, with some changes consistent with the patient's age. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of room in there, Paul, is there? <laughs> Lots of room, yeah, they can rush around. <laughs> well, on a serious note, going back to what Paul was saying, the, the first explanation for acute mountain sickness was, a, was this tight fit hypothesis. So the idea was that as you went to altitude, your brain swelled. Uh, and in those people who were older, who had a bit more room, that swelling didn't amount to much and didn't cause symptoms. And those people with a larger brain, uh, when that swelled, they got AMS. But it, it hasn't been borne out by research, either in laboratories or uh, high altitude. I, I think, and Chris will be able to answer this uh, much better than I will, but I think the jury is still out on a, on a really convincing explanation of the pathway from a low level of oxygen to acute mountain sickness, I think. That's uh, a question for the next generation of researchers to answer, and I, I look forward to hearing that. To a certain extent, we're trying to answer that question with the study we're doing, but I think going back to age and the risk of getting AMS, I think part of it goes down to experience. 
and the other thing is you can't move as quickly as you get older I've discovered so um, naivety of youth and being fit allowed me to get up mountains fast enough to get really sick now I move more slowly and it's less likely but maybe it's an atrophic brain I don't know I'll go with another YouTube question. Um, regarding AMS, is there a benefit in using Diamox after the onset of symptoms or is it purely for prevention? Who wants to pick this one up? Well, I can. Uh, the majority of research that's out there is just focuses on using Diamox to prevent AMS. There's very little that I've ever come across that shows it's of any benefit once you've got established symptoms of, of acute man sickness. Uh, and personally, I don't use it or administer it to those who've got acute mountain sickness. Chris, you coming in there? No, I, I, I think that cetazolamide can be used either for prophylaxis for prevention or for treatment. Uh, I think by the time you're talking about using it for treatment, you probably will maybe including other drugs like uh, nifedipine or dexamethasone. And really, you, you need to be thinking of heading down anyway, if it's that bad. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, a rest day can sometimes, uh, without going any higher, and sometimes pay dividends depending on how bad you are. Um, now, Nigel, did you say there was? Oh, uh, no, I see a hand up from Derek. Is that Derek right? Again? Yep, you've unmoved to me again. Yeah, it, it's a comment really on the purification of fluids at high altitude. I mean, you've made some very good points there about where you can or where you should take water from and where you shouldn't. But one thing uh, from experience is uh, I'm a chemist, um, and one of the groups, that I, one of the people I was with some years ago. Um, was having vitamin C flavorings put into his drinks and then adding the sterilizer afterwards. Now that, no one's mentioned this, but this is not good news because iodine and chlorine react very, very rapidly with ascorbic acid, which is what vitamin C is. Absolutely. And that would basically stop it killing off any bacteria that or viruses that are actually in this uh, solution. So the word of caution is do not add chlorine or iodine tablets to solutions that have actually got lots of vitamin C already in them. That's, that's exactly right Derek, you can, you can sterilize clear uh, water that doesn't have any particulate matter in it with uh, the halogens like the chlorine and the, the, the iodine. Iodine is quite a little bit more efficacious in the field um, but it, it, I think it got voted as the worst taste uh, in some survey. And some people just can't stand it at all. I like it. it reminds me of expeditions and faraway places and, and, and good comradeship. Um, but some people put citrate in after they've sterilized it to neutralize it, which it does to That's neutralize solid, the taste, yeah. but it also neutralizes the effect, which means if you then use that same container with some citrate contamination that you cannot then use it to sterilize the next batch. Uh, I think that's really quite important. The other thing to note, of course, is that um, uh, iodine is uh, classed as a, a biocide and because the manufacturers never sought a European license it's now not available in the whole of Europe for use for sterilizing water. It is still available in some pharmacies as 2% tincture of iodine which is what the old stuff was it just simply says on it for external use only but it's largely been replaced now by, um, by chlorine dioxide which is is better in the sense it's more efficacious against cryptosporidium which the the chlorine and the um, and the uh, iodine never did, uh, but the, the the difference with the chlorine dioxide is that whereas uh, plain chlorine and iodine would continue to work in the vessel to stop any further contamination, chlorine dioxide doesn't. Right. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Paul. I've got a couple a couple more on YouTube. Um, right. I thought the paramide was not good for bacterial DNV. Best to empty the system. Is there evidence for this? And then yeah. Ben goes on to say, like trying to clean the bath with the plug-in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're, you're right. The paramide is not curative. Uh, it's, it's barely therapeutic. Uh, it's simply holding all the stuff in the bowel, and there's this sort of um, feeling that if you, you want to let this toxic effluent out, if you can get to the toilet, and yes, that would be a, a reasonable um, hypothesis. It, 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 is, it, it does actually promote absorption of fluid and salts, and it possibly has some mild, 
minor anti-secretory properties, but it's it's not classified as a therapy as such. It is simply bunging you up to to let, make life easier. If, for example, you're you're getting up every hour and can't sleep, or if you have to go on a bus journey or something similar. An important point to note is that if you use it uh, with antibiotics, there's about three and a half times the the incidence of promotion of resistant organisms. So that is to be borne in mind. So if you can get to the loo, yes. Uh, if you can't, it can be used, but not in dysentery, of course. Um, right. there, is, there have been some interesting anecdotal reports about ginkgo biloba supplements being useful as a prophylaxis against AMS. Any thoughts? Very difficult. The preparations of ginkgo uh, vary tremendously between different studies. Uh, tend to be very small studies, not particularly of great quality. Uh, Personally, I wouldn't trust them. Uh, I, I know there's a, a, an enthusiasm for uh, natural herbal prep preparations, but I, I don't think this really cuts it and, and doesn't stand up to comparison with, uh, uh, with more established uh, prophylactic drugs. Yeah, I looked through the literature a few years ago and couldn't find any good evidence. Right, Melanie. Hello, um, I have a quick question about fainting. Uh, so, I, I'm feeble, I know, but I've, I sometimes faint at sea level as well. And I have had a couple of expeditions where I've felt faint, um, usually only between about 5,000 and 6,000 meters. I've, I've climbed higher and I've been okay. And I just wondered if, if fainting is like a symptom of AMS, if it's problematic. To me, it's always been separate. I've always been like cognitively okay and in control and able to think, but feeling a bit faint. So I was wondering on your thoughts, about your thoughts on fainting and, and AMS? Well, Melanie, I'll come in as a GP here. Um, yes, you obviously are feeble and pathetic if you only get up to six or 7,000 meters. I mean, this really worries me. Um, but I am also worried about keeling over at sea level. Uh, I love the uh, Southwest sea cliffs. Um, the trouble with fainting is there are a lot of different things to take into account. Uh, one of the most obvious ones is dehydration and things like that. And there are multiple causes. It's interesting. This does not sound like it's related per se to altitude to me. Um, but I'm more than happy again to have comments from others on this. Anyone else want to comment? Well, I think you need to look at the blood pressure. Um, because that's the key determinant in terms of blood supply to the brain and keeping everything working well. When you hyperventilate, you blow off uh, carbon dioxide, you actually vasoconstrict, you get less blood going to the brain. There are a number of potential things here. I suspect it's not AMS. I think it's just part of uh, uh, acclimatizing. I think it would be helpful to know your blood pressure when you're not feeling well like that. The only other thing is, you know, on a rather more serious note, is whether or not you've got any rhythm disturbance or anything like that. Uh, Jeremy's probably got some views too. Yeah, I, as well, I think I mentioned earlier that it's typical for you to lose two or three percent of your total body water when you acclimatize successfully at altitude. So you are effectively dehydrated to perform effectively at altitude. It, it, it works. And I think I see a lot of female patients who typically have a, a low normal resting blood pressure of, you know, 100 systolic and that sort of loss of total body water will cause your blood pressure to be a little lower. And if you're hot and a little bit dilated and you stand up quickly, uh, I, I can see how a, a faint or, or f feelings of faintness ca can, can occur. If it's occurring at sea level, it, it's well worth seeking uh, investigation, actually. Yeah. Um, perhaps an echocardiogram and things like that, just looking at the structure of the heart. Right. Thank you. Um, we've just had, um, I've been reminded of another UKC comment, and I'm going to go around each person asking to come up with one thing. But someone said, what would you carry as a priority in a UK first aid kit for a day on, the, uh, on big mountain crags? So, um, Paul, perhaps you'd tell us your one thing. <laughs> My immediate thought was a small vial of whiskey. <laughs> thank that. you, not thank you, Paul. That, that's allowed. Oh, uh, Jeremy. Mobile phone. <laughs> Excellent. Chris. Uh, 
I was going to go for a mobile phone as well. Um, you, trying to predict what is going to happen, you have to think where you're going. Um, my fault, small first aid kit has got a triangular bandage and a few other bits and pieces. Um, some simple painkillers, not a great deal there, a pen knife. What would you take, David? Well, I think the most valuable thing is the information you've actually got in your brain, uh, experience and uh, uh, practical thoughts. But what I would do is point the person in the direction of the BMC website, where if you look under mountaineering or climbing, you'll find a medical section and you'll find in there a form or two forms you can download possibly onto waterproof paper which are an accident report form and a patient report form they're very very simple um, you need a pencil to go with them but it acts as a prompt if you're dealing with a friend and you're emotionally involved and it's difficult to think clearly uh, before you use your mobile phone if you fill those in the information you give to a rescue team would make a massive difference to how they react. David, I think, and as you know, from every intake of the Diploma of Mountain Medicine, this, this produces a, an enormous debate. And medical kits are very individual, aren't they? And one of the important things is that they really should be thought about as an individual, because that means that that person then has to think about what might happen what knowledge do I have to do something about it? And what kit might I want in the field? If you're just getting off the shelf kit and it's got parts and things in it that you have no knowledge on how to use, you're really reliant on somebody else just passing by who knows how to use it. So I think one of the things with medical kits is to think what might happen and think what I would like to have should it happen. I think that's totally right, Paul. And thinking it through means you're already prepared. Yeah. Uh, I did a review of commercial medical kits once from a climbing shop. And with the Ortlieb one, I said, magnificent bag. Pity about the contents. I think they, uh, Jim Millage is trying to ask a question. Ah. And I think it would be lovely to bring him in. Yeah, Jim. Uh, Jim, I should tell everyone, is uh, most likely has been more formative in all our mountain medicine careers, both climbing and in terms of research, than well, any other person in Britain. I'm eternally grateful to him because he passed my PhD thesis. So <laughs> I'm eternally grateful to him because he got me on the MEF screening committee, which I passed on to you, Chris. And uh, I suspect we're all grateful to him. Jim, uh, would you like to come in here? Yes, you're very kind. I've been trying to Especially around mutiny for some time, but uh, <laughs> originally when we were talking about um, brain swelling and things, I'm sure that in my um, fairly long career climbing, I've become much less susceptible to mountain sickness. And I have to attribute that to, to the fact that I've got more <laughs> space to swell into before the pressure begins to go up. Um, certainly the last time I went to Everest Base Camp, for instance, I went up in, in very quick order. It was a bit, a bit of a time ago, I couldn't uh, get up at that speed now. But um, that was one of the things I wanted to say. Jim, Jim, do you remember that mountain that we all climbed in 2000 uh, in, in South America, in Chile, where we did in fact summit in reverse age order and the youngest person didn't make it? <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> it was bad that it was now. <laughs> and I remember in Iran at a meeting, uh, you gave an excellent talk on slow acclimatization <laughs> and rushed up uh, Damavand far <laughs> quicker than you recommended to anybody else. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, you preach it very well, um, Jim, but we all know you have never really practiced it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm very, very fortunate. That's the important thing. Anyway, um, it's lovely to have you with us. <laughs> yes, I've enjoyed the session. It's been great fun. <laughs> Thank you. So, that so many people nowadays are um, are interested in mountain medicine. Yeah. I started in the uh, I told before I can't try to remember um, the um, almost number on the fingers of one hand the number of people interested. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Silver Hut expedition was one of the great uh, mountain physiology ex research expeditions um, just below, um, oh, what peak is it? Um, 
behind Dab on the meat. Yeah, I'm a just below Amadablam, and uh, the research done on that expedition is still quoted as good quality research. So we have a lot to owe, Jim. It was a wonderful expedition. I was so fortunate to get on it, and uh, <clears throat> I wasn't in any way experienced then. But the one thing I did was to um, try, as I've always done, try to um, uh, follow my mother's advice, which was <clears throat> seek the opportunity of a lifetime in the lifetime of the opportunity. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> good motto. <laughs> yes, and many junior doctors in Britain follow Jim's advice, <laughs> which upsets a lot of their employers. <laughs> thank you, Jim. I get the uh, <laughs> no, Chris's question. Well, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, is it possible to suffer a minor stroke through exposure to high altitude? And if so, could it cause permanent damage to the brain? This one is certainly one for Chris, I think, isn't it? So, uh, a really good question, Chris. Uh, yes, there's no doubt at all that you could suffer a stroke at altitude. One of the uh, factors that affects people going to altitude, and we've talked about it before, is dehydration. The blood gets thicker. It gets thicker anyway as you acclimatise. Um, and so you become much more at risk of either having a heart attack or a stroke. You can have different sorts of strokes also where there's not enough oxygen getting there, uh, um, but that's less common. There were some studies done um, about 2000 where they looked at MRs uh, on climbers, elite climbers have been to extreme altitude without oxygen. There was some evidence of um, damage uh, on those brain scans. Interestingly, on scans that have been repeated, that seems to be less common, but it's a, it's a good question. It's very real, yes, indeed. And can I uh, just ask a quick one? Um, can anyone tell me if further research has been carried out on the use of beetroot juice to aid acclimatization? So, yes. 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 Se several uh, papers have come out just in the last couple of years. Unfortunately, they've not showed any benefit in preventing acute mountain sickness. Oh, really? So. <laughs> I did turn up in the Alps with a friend who opened the boot of his car and had 24 litres of beetroot juice in there. <laughs> he, he's actually a doctor as well. <laughs> I just laughed. Um, but uh, Chris, did you want to say something there? I saw you light up for a moment. No, I mean, it's, it's thought to have antioxidant properties and Damien Bailey down in uh, South Wales will be a strong proponent, but uh, as far as I'm an, aware, and I'm sure Jim might want to comment, the evidence is very marginal, if at all. Right. Nigel, how do you feel about this? Um, well, uh, David has waited very patiently and he's asked his question in the chat, actually. Right. So, David, do you want to come in there? I'm a ski mountaineer and quite often I've got numb uh, fingers and toes. You now, Chris was saying about thrombotic uh, conditions in extremities uh, and treating them like any other thrombotic disease. I, mean, I wonder if uh, if I experience the numbness, uh, taking some aspirin might uh, might actually help in some way. I think at our age, aspirin is a good idea as long as there's no contraindication. So if you've got history of um, stomach ulcer or anything like that, that would be a bad idea. Um, but uh, certainly I do use it at extreme altitude, thins the blood slightly. Would it reduce the risk of um, frostbite? I think that's much more behavioural. My, my concern was more a heart attack or a stroke. I'm going to play. Uh, sorry. My Come concern was, was the way it felt. Jeremy. Well, could I play devil's advocate and say I wouldn't touch aspirin with a barge pole at altitude? Uh, I think the potential of side effects are considerable and you're not treating the same pathophysiology. You're not treating the same disease process that you're treating at say, sea level when you, when you use aspirin. You use aspirin to stop platelets from working and from platelets binding together, causing a clot. The reality is the strokes and issues that you get at altitude are not through platelets mucking around. They're due to a much more complicated picture and throwing aspirin at the problem, I don't think is gonna make any difference. And just exposure to side effects. 
and also the potential of, of that belief that you think, well, I'm taking a tablet and I'm going to be okay, which I think is you know, really dangerous when it comes to using drugs as prophylaxis. Excellent. We've got a disagreement between two experts there, which is always a good place to, uh, to wind this up, which I'm afraid we're going to have to do. I know there are some hands still up. Uh, if you want to uh, send them in, is that right, Nigel? Yeah, yeah. Um, we will try and deal with them in some way. Um, thank you all. It's been a brilliant audience. We didn't know if it would work. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's helped with this. Um, there's a massive IT team behind us because they've been dealing with some Luddites working very odd shifts. So thanks to people like Nigel, Tim, um, Matt, Michael and uh, Nick and a whole load of other people. Uh, we've been coached for this. Um, we relied on the, the old bedside manner of complete bullshit and bluffing, but you seem to have tolerated it very well. Um, thanks to the audience who was so important. Those with an interest, do Google the British Mountain Medicine Society. You don't have to be a doctor. Next week's Alpine Clubcast 8 is entitled Agui de Peleron. Uh, Rab Carrington, Andy Parkin and John Bracey talk about new routing on the Peleron. In February 1975, Rab Carrington and Alan Rouse brought hard Scottish-style climbing to the Alps with their winter ascent of the Terre Rebofa route on the Peleron above Chamonix. 17 years later, Andy Parkin and Mark Twight climbed the nearby Good and Evil, uh, sorry, Beyond Good and Evil. And in February 2020, 18 years after that, John Bracey, Matt Helica, and Pete Whittaker added Beyond Reason. In their own way, each of these ascents have set new standards for our sport. Um, but why has this corner of the Chamonix Agui been a testbed for the best climbers of their respective generations? Find out next week. Um, do have a look at our Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, share uh, all the previous Alpine Clubcasts, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks all for joining us. Uh, stay active, stay safe, and stay alert. Good night from London. <laughs>